Welcome to FSA Lecture 2, Part B, Understanding the Business. In Part B, we're going to focus on industry analysis. Industry analysis is another important step of understanding the business. So we're still in step one of our business analysis framework. And the importance for industry analysis is that the level of competition within, indus within an industry highly influences the ability of a firm to actually create value. Now, when we talk about a firm creating value, that means that a firm is able to earn a return higher than their cost of capital. We're going to use that sentence a lot during this semester. A firm generates value when it earns a return higher than its cost of capital. Industry factors and industry influences really influence whether a firm is actually able to do this. We're going to start with a little bit of revision from your introdu introductory economic subjects. We're going to reflect back on how economists discuss industry competition. On one side, we have perfect competition within an industry, which means there's lots of competitors. If we look down on this axis for perfect competition, the number of firms is high. There's a lot of firms in the same industry and the firm's influence of price levels is low within perfect competition. At the other end of the continuum, we have a monopoly situation. A monopoly means there's only one firm in an industry so there's a low number of firms and they have a high influence on pricing levels. And somewhere in between, we've got an oligopoly or duopoly where there's two to sort of 10 or 15 firms in an industry or monopolistic competition, which is kind of where most industries sit, where there's a normal level of competition within a market. So let's focus on these different terms in a little bit more detail. In a pure monopoly situation, that means a single firm is the sole provider of goods or services within an industry. There will be no close substitutes to that product or service that other firms are able to provide. This allows the monopoly provider to be a price maker. They set the price and customers have to either accept or reject that price. There's no bargaining, there's no going and um, utilizing a competitor's product which is selling for a cheaper price. A monopoly requires a limited ability for competitors to actually enter the market. And this usually comes about for a couple of key reasons. Things like patents, geography, regulation, technology, and licenses all can prevent competition in certain industries. The key thing to remember about a monopoly provider is that they are therefore able to generate economic profits. That means they are able to earn a return higher than their cost of capital and generate value into the future. Here are some examples of where monopolies may have come into play in real life and some of the reasons behind it. The, here we've got a newspaper article that says the ACCC takes aim at airports monopoly. Sydney Airport is a monopoly provider due to government regulation. They have a non-compete clause where they get to operate the only airport within Sydney. Now that will change in the next couple of years as Sydney does open up its second airport in Badgerys Creek, but for a long time, Sydney Airport has been a monopoly provider of airport services. And in the article, it discusses that they've been able to increase their revenue by three to 4% each year and increase the charges for every passenger using that airport. The reason why they're able to continually increase the prices is because there's no competition in the market. People want to come to Sydney and it's the number one and the only airport that international guests can fly into. Another reason that monopolies pop up is often due to geographic restrictions. In this article, I'm looking at pink diamonds. Pink diamonds are mostly found in one particular mine, which was in Northern Territory, and it was owned by Rio Tinto, the Argyle mine. So the Argyle mine is responsible for 90% of the world's supply of pink diamonds. Because the Argyle mine has such a tight control over world pink diamond supply, Rio Tinto therefore were able to set the prices of pink diamonds. And subsequently, pink diamonds are the most expensive diamonds in the world. Patents and other restrictions and copyrights and things like that can also prevent, or can also cause a monopoly over certain situations. For example, this graph here shows different drugs that have had patents which expired. So for a certain period of time, the pharmaceutical company will have a patent over a particular product and no one else can create that same product to sell. So there's no perfect competition. There's no, there's no ability for multiple suppliers to um, create and sell the same product. One company 
is able to produce that individual product and generate lots of revenue. Here we can see some of the drugs that were coming up to their patent expiry in 2016 were earning billions and billions of dollars each year. Superior technology can also lead to monopolies forming in certain industries. If we look at the market share for different search engine providers, we can see that Google has a massive market share. For a long period of time, Google has been over 90% of search engines around the world. Their next best competitor Bing is only at 2.44% of the market. This superior technology has then allowed Google to use their market position in potentially bad ways. So this article discusses how in the US, Google are facing antitrust investigation. Antitrust is laws relating to the fact that monopolies in certain situations can be illegal. And if businesses use their monopoly power in a negative way, there are laws that can break up the companies. Now, Google has had to face these kind of laws in both Europe, and now they're starting to face them in USA as well. When we start to move away from a monopoly and we start to introduce more suppliers into an industry, we can have either an oligopoly or a duopoly. A duopoly means there are two providers of a service or good in a market, whereas an oligopoly means two to a small amount. Often people might say two to 10 or two to 15. There's no exact number required there. Overall though, both of these duopolies and oligopolies require a small number of sellers to be within an industry. And that, that allows for all of these suppliers to have influence over the market. There will still be barriers to entry for new competition and duopolies and oligopolies still often earn economic profit. That means they are generating a return higher than their cost of capital and creating value. This is especially the case when duopolies and oligopolies do not compete on price. They have maybe some sort of implicit arrangement where they will compete on the product quality and differentiate their products rather than competing purely on price and entering into price wars. Now, this is often done implicitly, but it can also be done explicitly, which is illegal, which is forming a price cartel. So in 2016, Australia decided to prosecute the first criminal cartel uh, in Australian legal history. And this was looking at a Japanese shipping company, which were trying to set the prices with other shipping companies to make sure they could maximize their profit. Now this is illegal, but there's a lot of profit to be made if you can get together with your competitors and decide to set a floor price. So we've got this company here. They are a Japanese global shipping giant. They pled guilty to engaging in cartel conduct following the investigation by the Australian Competition and Com Consumer Commission. More recently, a large Australian company, Blue Scope, they're Australia's largest steel producer. They have also been accused of forming a price cartel with senior executives flying around the world to discuss with other steel manufacturers about setting minimum pricing. Again, with the aim of manipulating the industry, manipulating the prices up and maximizing profit for the whole industry. Next up, we can discuss perfect competition. This is on the complete opposite side of the continuum of industry competition compared to a monopoly. Perfect competition means there's going to be multiple suppliers of nearly identical goods or services. There's going to be no barriers to entry or very minimal barriers to entry into the, new, into the market and suppliers are therefore price takers. Customers have the power, customers set the price and the suppliers just have to accept the price customers are willing to pay. Examples of this would be the agricultural industry because products there are often commoditized and they're price of these goods, such as sugar and corn and cocoa, they follow commodity price cycles. The market is open. The farmer doesn't get to set the price of the corn that they produce. They have to sell it onto a broad market where all corn is equal and there's no real differentiation between the products there. So what's the importance of understanding these economic concepts? Well, a firm's ability to generate value, that is create a return higher than its cost of capital, really depends on the amount of competition within the industry. You need to be able to understand, is your firm a monopoly provider, which is going to have high profits and low competition, or are they operating in a really competitive industry, which is more close to perfect competition? Now, this is a continuum, and most firms in real life will be somewhere between those two extremes, probably closer to the monopolistic competition kind of spectrum.
Just to illustrate that different industries do actually have very different profitability, we've got this figure here. This figure is from a journal article which I've posted up on UTS Online, which we'll talk about soon. At the top, the security brokers and dealers industry in the US had an average return on invested capital of 40.9%. As we go all the way down the bottom, the airline industry only had an average return on invested capital of 5.9%. What causes these different industries to have such different returns? Well, the level of competition between firms within an industry is one of the main factors here. So if the firm is a monopoly or in perfect competition, it really does affect things. However, we can have a more useful framework for, analys for analysis of industries, and that's called Porter's Five Forces. Porter's Five Forces you may be familiar with from previous subjects. It's a very common uh, framework in strategy and management, and it gets you to think about the different factors that influence a business or industry's profitability. So we need to know these five factors and we need to be able to apply them to the firm or industry that we're studying to get an understanding of what sort of profitability is likely to occur in the future. We're going to talk about each of these five factors individually. I'm going to go through them reasonably briefly, but I would encourage you to watch this YouTube video, with, which is a Harvard interview with Michael Porter, who's the professor who came up with Porter's Five Forza. So this is Michael Porter, and it's about a 10 minute video, and he goes into a lot of detail about why this is so useful. And he also applies it to the airline industry, which we will also do because Qantas is our case study that we're looking at this semester. The graph that I just showed about the different industry profitabilities comes from this article, The Five Competitive Forces That Shape Strategy, which is an article written by Michael Porter. I've posted a link to the UTS library for this article. And again, I recommend you read this because it does provide a really good introduction into Porter's Five Forces and provides some tips for how you can actually implement this framework into your firm or industry analysis. So the first factor that Porter introduces is rivalry among existing firms. This rivalry among existing firms relates back to what I was just talking about with industry competition. Is your firm a monopoly or is it in perfect competition or somewhere in between those two spectrums? Rivalry among existing firms is really important in, in influencing industry profitability. As there's more competition within an industry, prices get pushed towards the marginal cost of production and firms are able to create less value from being in that industry. It also then makes non-price dimensions that is competing on quality rather than pricing of your products more important. Now, the determinants of intensity of competition also varies across a range of different dimensions. First of all, the industry growth rate's important. If your industry is growing really rapidly, firms often don't have to compete as aggressively with each other. That is, if the pie keeps getting bigger, you can all take your share and still be a profitable and growing firm. However, if an industry is stagnant or mature and is not growing very rapidly, the only way you can grow your business is by taking market share from your competitors. And that means competition will be much more fierce between firms as they all try and steal market share from each other. The concentration and balance of competitors, that is perfect competition compared to monopoly and where on the spectrum an industry is, is also a really important key. If there's a high concentration of competition, such as maybe three or four firms in an oligopoly setting, they may compete on non-price dimensions and be able to maintain profitability in an industry. The degree of differentiation in products and services and switching costs is also really important. The switching cost refers to how easy it is for a customer to go from one supplier to another supplier. Now in some industries, it's really difficult for a customer to change. If you think about phones, Apple lock in their customers into the Apple ecosystem. Android lock in customers into the Android ecosystem. It's very rare for people to switch back and forth between Apple and Android. The same with Windows versus Mac. Businesses create these systems and they hope their customers stay in that. They're trying to build switching costs into their customers. We don't want customers easily able to switch to competitors' products. Threat of new entrants then relates to rivalry because if an industry doesn't have very strong rivalry, it may 
in the future. That is, if it is easy for new entrants to enter into an industry, there's a high threat of new entrants, then low competition currently may change in the future. And that will affect our forecasting in the future as well. So the ease with which a new firm can enter an industry will affect the profitability of other firms within the industry. There are a lot of factors affecting the barriers to entry, such as some of those ones that I mentioned for a monopoly industry before, such as geography, patents, licenses, all those kind of things can prevent new entrants from joining the market. In addition, economies of scale is really important. If I wanted to start a new business to compete with Coca-Cola, it's going to be really difficult for me to get the funding and the infrastructure and the uh, manufacturing capacity in place to try and compete with a company like Coca-Cola that have economies of scale in their production. So large manufacturing companies that are already existing have economies of scale advantages. New competitors would have to come in and invest a huge amount in their capacity to make sure their prices of products can be competitive. First mover advantage is often a really important thing. Microsoft have a huge, a huge advantage in the software industry because everyone uses Windows. A lot of people just continue using Windows. Apple had a very difficult time becoming the second major operating system. And even then, people are very much stuck in either the Windows or Mac operating system. It's very hard to launch a new operating system that's going to be successful in the future because of first mover advantage. Those businesses are already well established in the industry. Access to channels and distribution is also really important. Like my Coca-Cola example, if I wanted to create a new soft drink product, being able to put it in new stores, arranging a contract so McDonald's sell my soft drink or the local corner store or even the university, it's going to be difficult because Coca-Cola or Pepsi usually have exclusive deals with these kind of businesses. They have their distribution channels already set up and locked into long-term contracts. Then, of course, there's legal barriers such as patents and things like that that prevent companies from coming in and competing on similar product grounds. The threat of substitute products is also really important. Some industries have really obvious substitute products and other industries that you analyze, it might be a little bit harder to think about what the substitute product is. So a substitute product is something that a customer can change to that provides the same overall need or want that the customer has. So for example, if we think of something like a car, a car provides transport services to the consumer. A consumer could switch from a car to a truck, to a bus, to a train, aeroplane, boat, push bike, motorbike. There's lots of clear substitute products that all provide transport services, helping the customer get from point A to point B. If you think about something like a casino, what does a casino do? It allows customers to gamble. Well, maybe we could bet on horse racing or the casino or other sports, but we could define the industry more broadly as entertainment. And then casinos have to compete on more than just the gambling products, but also other sources of entertainment. Someone on the weekend might go to a casino and gamble, or they might go to a show or a sports game, and suddenly the industry is much broader, and the threat of substitute products could be a much wider suite of things than strictly gambling products. So the degree to which substitutes exist depends on the relative price and performance of competing products. Switching your car for a bike might be a very useful substitute if you've got a small commute, but switching your car for a bike might not be good if you want to travel 100 kilometers every day. So the price and performance trade-off does vary a lot between different customers and the products that we're looking at. The bargaining power of buyers will also vary a lot throughout industries. Buyer bargaining power can exert a lot of downward prices on, um, can exert a lot of downward pressure on prices. Factors that affect the bargaining power of buyers are things like the number of buyers, the volume per buyer, switching costs, differentiation, and the importance of product for costs and quality. So the number of buyers is a really important one. If we're running a supermarket like Coles and Woolworths, they have millions and millions of unique customers. If I go into Woolworths, I can't do a very good job at bargaining with Woolworths and getting a 20% discount on my shopping bill. However, if we're running a business that only has two or three potential buyers, maybe I'm manufacturing something for the military and the military is my only customer. Well, if the military says I want a 10% discount, 
suddenly I probably have to do it because there's no one else I'm able to sell my products to. So the bargaining power of buyers depends on how many buyers you actually have. Similarly, the volume per buyer. If I go into Woolworths and ask for a discount, I'm probably not going to get it. But if Woolworths had a um, commercial arrangement with another business who is buying in bulk, they may get some discounts if they're buying millions of a product compared to my one or two items. Finally, the bargaining power of suppliers is the mirror image of the bargaining power of buyers. The number of suppliers, the concentration, the they all influence the power of the suppliers. So suppliers have bargaining power when there are a few substitutes and a few suppliers relative to the number of customers demanding a product or service. All of these five factors influence the profitability of industries. So let's take that framework and briefly discuss it with the aviation industry in Australia. We've got the Qantas case study up on UTS Online, so we'll talk a little bit more about Qantas. First of all, our first force was rivalry among existing firms. Within the airline industry, there is a lot of rivalry among existing firms. There's lots of different airlines that fly into and out of Australia, and they all compete with Qantas. Here we've put Singapore Airlines, Qantas. One of the companies that you can study for your assignment this semester is Air New Zealand. Within the domestic market, there's also Virgin Airways as well. The competition is fierce. There are lots of different suppliers of airlines and flights, and the rivalry is always very, very difficult in the airline industry. What about the threat of new entrants? Well, although the Australian industry hasn't really seen many new entrants in recent years, there is always a threat of new entrants in the airline market because it's relatively cheap to start a new airline in that you can start by leasing a plane you can lease positions at the airport and you can start up with just one or two routes or flight paths to start with and build a capacity that way. That's why there's always so many new airlines popping up around the world. Although it does seem like a really uh, capital intensive industry, there is always the ability to rent your assets to get started early and grow from there. The threat of substitute products. Now, the domestic aviation industry compared to the international aviation industry have a really big difference in the threat of substitutes here. A car is a threat of a substitute. If I was going to fly to Melbourne, I could drive to Melbourne. However, if I wanted to fly to California, I couldn't drive to California. Okay, so you could break up Qantas's products into domestic versus international flights, and we can then analyze the industry in different ways there. There's going to be different substitutes. To get to America, my only other substitute would be hopping on a boat. And that's so slow, the performance of that is not very good, and it's still very expensive. So not many customers will easily switch to a substitute product. They're much more likely to switch to one of our rival airlines. The final two of Porter's Five Forces are the bargaining power of customers and suppliers. Now, customers don't have much bargaining power over Qantas. They're plenty there's lots and lots of different customers they're diverse they don't have many they don't have much buying power overall now some mass purchases will have a little bit of bargaining power such as maybe um, travel agents and for example the university has special deals with Qantas because they book so many flights and large corporations that book a lot of flights may have a little bit of pricing power over Qantas they might get some discounts but generally the bargaining power of customers is pretty low relative to airlines. However, the suppliers on the other hand is a completely different factor. You can only really buy aeroplanes from two suppliers, Boeing and Airbus. So therefore, if there's money to be made in the airline industry, Boeing and Airbus can just increase the prices of the planes they're gonna supply and they will keep the profits in their business rather than letting Qantas and the other airlines keep all the profits. So there's a high level of bargaining power within those particular suppliers. You can also think about the employees and the fuel providers, which make up the other two large costs of Qantas. Qantas have no bargaining power over the oil price. That's set by commodity markets and they are, Qantas are a price taker. So as oil prices increase, Qantas lose out on profitability. Likewise, labor. Qantas have to pay their employees certain minimum wages. A 
a lot of their employees are in a union and therefore Qantas have low bargaining power over the pilots and the baggage handlers and as regularly strikes and industrial relations concerns relating to their labor payments. So if we take all those factors into account, there's a lot of rivalry between airlines and there's huge bargaining power of suppliers in the airline industry. The threat of substitutes isn't a huge problem in a lot of cases. So that one's not as big of a problem. The bargaining power of buyers isn't so high, but the rivalry, the threat of new entrants and the bargaining power of suppliers are all against airlines, which is why we see airlines being at the bottom of the industry analysis profitability here. Okay. By understanding the five forces, we can apply that to airlines and see or understand why they belong at the bottom of the back. If you compare that to security brokers and dealers, so people working in finance, um, running stock exchanges, selling shares, those kind of things, the five forces are much more favorable for them. The buyers and suppliers don't have much power over them. There is a rivalry among firms, but it's more of a oligopoly set up in the finance industry and the firms don't compete on price very often. They usually compete on having a differentiated product, which allows profit margins to stay high. So other factors that you need to think about when you do an industry analysis, you can't just do Porter's five forces. It's a fantastic framework, but you also need to know more about the industry. You need to think about are there key regulations that you, uh, govern your industry or that are changing over time that may change the profitability of an industry. You need to think about what are the key success factors for businesses that are successful in your industry? What is the position of your firm with the industry? Your profitability may be different if you're the big player in an industry compared to if you're a new upstart small firm. So when you do an industry analysis, always start with some of the basics. Get the facts and figures of the size of the industry, the growth rate, the market share of the different firms within the industry, who the competitors are and what they do differently. Start with those basics and then move into Porter's Five Forces to try and get a better understanding of the overall industry profitability. So let's finish off with some practice questions. What is a substitute product for a car? We already talked about this briefly. A car has many, many substitute products. A car is a transport solution. So any other product that allows you to transport yourself from one place to another, whether it be walking or a push bike, all the way up to an aeroplane or a ship. These are all substitute products for cars. Does an industry with a highly unionized workforce influence industry profitability? Yes, your workforce is a supplier of your business. If your business has a highly unionized workforce, if profits get too high, employees will want their share of that profit. A highly unionized workforce will be better able to bargain and get their share of new high profits. So industries that have highly unionized workforces often find that in good times when profits are high, the employees do get a larger share of that profit compared to industries that don't have a unionized workforce. Is it better to be in an industry with high growth relative to low growth? Well, often it doesn't matter. The airline industry has experienced huge growth increases in the last couple of years. There's been millions and millions of people around the world who are entering into the middle class who are traveling on airplanes for the first time. The number of flights taken throughout the world has been increasing by a rapid rate every year, yet airlines still struggle for profitability. So just because it's a high growth industry doesn't mean it's a profitable industry. Likewise, low growth industries can sometimes still be really profitable. Tobacco firms have been incredibly profitable over the last couple of decades. Smoking in the developed world is not an increasing trend, but tobacco firms still make high levels of profit. So the growth rate of an industry, if an industry is fashionable or growing or new tech or low tech, doesn't necessarily influence the profitability on its own. You need to take into account all of the five forces to see if that's going to be the case. Another one, how do supermarkets try and increase buyers switching cost? As a customer, I can easily walk into a Coles supermarket or a Woolworths supermarket. How do they stop me from switching? What supermarkets try and do is they try and build loyalty within their customer base. This is a way of building switching costs. A lot of the supermarkets have given discounts on petrol if you shop with them. Again, if I shop with Woolworths, I get a discount for the Woolworths petrol station. So it, try, it tries to link me to their products. So there's a switching cost. 
I won't shop with Woolworths and then go to a different petrol station because I won't get that discount. It builds a cost into my behavior. They also use loyalty points and discounts if you're a member and if you have a certain amount of loyalty points. These are all ways of trying to keep customers loyal, building in switching costs and allowing them to increase the profitability within an industry that's otherwise very competitive. Other firms like Costco have tried to build switching costs by making customers actually pay a membership to join the supermarket. So unless you're a member and pay your annual fee and get a card, you can't go and shop with them. Again, it's a way of incentivizing customers to keep coming back so they get value out of their annual membership. So in conclusion, an industry analysis is really important for valuing a business. If you don't understand the profitability and the drivers of profitability within an industry, you won't be able to do a good job of forecasting the returns in the future. Specifically, you won't be able to forecast if your business is likely to generate a return higher than their cost of capital. That is, generate a value for the shareholders. The economic analysis that we analyzed before will also help you do a better job of the industry analysis because the economy will affect industries overall. So these two uh, types of analysis are helpful and they build on each other. So if you do an industry analysis and an economic analysis separately in a group assignment, make sure you talk to each other because one level of analysis might inform the other. Thank you.